Did the evolutionists just kill a pterodactyl? Or did they finally catch up to the creationists? We find out in this season premiere of Genesis Week. And a welcome to the Season 5 premiere episode of Genesis Week. Thanks to all of you for making Genesis Week the success that it is. Five seasons running now of a weekly creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy. Carried right across Canada on the Miracle Channel. International viewers, including my American friends, can now catch Genesis Week on Roku every Thursday evening at 8 p.m. Central Time on the Genesis Science Network. Just search for Genesis Science Network on Roku and you'll find us. Or you can watch live streaming for free at GenesisScienceNetwork.com. Of course, you can still find us on the Christianima Network on YouTube. Christian cinema at its finest. Excellence in pirate broadcasting. We set up our studios at the old Armstrong radar base so we could continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear. And we continue to give glory to our creator while doing it. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in genesisweek.com where you can find us and subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Please, join me. The latest issue of the journal Antiquity had what would seem to be at first an oddly titled paper, The Death of a Pterodactyl. The authors, of course, were referring to a fairly well-known Indian pictograph located in Black Dragon Canyon in Utah. The pictograph was argued by many to be an oddly shaped winged creature uh, some creationists even argued it was a pterodactyl. Kalek et al., using portable X-ray fluorescence, have contended this claim in an, uh, is an error, and in fact, the alleged pterodactyl pictograph is a composite of five different pictographs. Calling the creationists to the carpet, the author specifically mentioned several by name, including our own fellow Canadian, author Vance Nelson who had included the pterodactyl interpretation in his beautifully done book, Dire Dragons, which is a gorgeous compilation of dinosaurs in ancient artwork from around the world. Vance is the author of Untold Secrets of Planet Earth series of books, a researcher with both a theology and biology degree, and he joins me now from his home in Alberta. Welcome to the show, Vance. Good to be here, Ian. Now, I can tell just by the look on your face, you're totally shocked by this paper, and you're going to strongly disagree with the interpretation presented, aren't you? Uh, not quite, Ian. It was not a surprise at all. Uh, actually, in uh, May of 2011, I uh, revisited the Black Dragon Canyon site uh, to take a look at the uh, pictographs again for myself. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, when I was at the site, uh, the first edition of my Dire Dragons book uh, was actually on the ocean coming over from China. I had uh, taken a look at many, many, many different books uh, on uh, rock art and that had uh, mentioned Black Dragon Canyon. And uh, interestingly, uh, these books were written by secular authors, supposedly experts on rock art of the American Southwest. And uh, up until uh, just before my books were getting ready to be delivered, the consensus from all of the books and literature that I had read was that this particular pictograph was a unified drawing, a unified pictograph made with pigments. Now, I had come across an exception just before my books were getting ready to be delivered, and the exception uh, was a book that I had read suggesting that it was not a unified pictograph. Now this was unfortunate in timing and so I decided well let me go back and uh, take a look at this. Now the other interesting thing is I was in communication with Dr. Gary Parker who is a very well-known creationist 
and uh, we were looking at a uh, fairly small image, actually an image that I had taken myself uh, when I was there previously. And uh, Dr. Parker, looking at the image, he said, you know, this looks like uh, not a unified pictograph, you know, one single image uh, made with pigment, but actually several. And uh, so I decided, you know, I need to go back and to check this out. And so I went back May 2011 and uh, a little more skeptical this time. And uh, when I went back, five separate images. Now, unfortunately, in 1947, uh, a gentleman had gone there and he had outlined these five images with chalk. And uh, that is why when you go now, uh, your eyes sort of draw all of these things together and you see a unified image. And so that was a problem uh, when this gentleman went and he actually wrote a paper, you know, we, we, we uh, outlined all of the uh, pictographic uh, artwork there and ah, it looks like a bird, some weird bird. Uh, well, the fact is there are five images there that I was able to see without x-ray fluorescence, okay, just with the naked eye. And the one on the far right is a serpentine creature, and you can actually see the forked tongue. You don't need any specialized equipment. Uh, at the far left are two quadrupeds. Uh, the far left one itself is a, a goat or a sheep. And uh, then there is a supplicating figure uh, uh, sort of in the center, and he's got his arms out, and you can actually see his legs, and you can see his feet. And then there's another one at the far left that's pretty severely eroded and the pigments are washing down and things like this. And so I mentioned this uh, to a number of members of the creationist community at the time, uh, etc. Then in 2012, Phil Center went and he said, ah, oh, there, there are five individual pictographs. And I had uh, talked with uh, Phil about this. I said, yeah, you're right. I said, some of your images aren't quite uh, accurate there though, Phil. And uh, then we had this paper come out, and uh, I was a little disturbed that uh, they referenced me for this particular reason. When I put out my book, now of course I had been there May 2011, and I find out that, you know what, I was wrong. And uh, this is about integrity, and so my book still hadn't been delivered, and so I was there, I find out, you know what, I was wrong. It's not a pterosaur at all. It's five individual figures. And guess what? Most of the secular authors were also wrong. It's not a bird. It's not a weird bird. It's not something like Fran Barnes said that looks like a Cretaceous flying reptile. Okay, it's not a unified object. It's five separate figures. And so what did I do? I did what someone has to do that has integrity and I put an erratum sticker on every single book of that first edition that says that the the evidence on those pages is an error and I apologize and all subsequent editions will no longer have that evidence now when I mailed out every single book that erratum sticker went on to every single book now the evolutionists that came out in 2012 and said, oh look, the creationists were wrong, cited me in 2012, Phil Center for example, and so I sort of emailed him and said, Phil, how come you did that? I didn't stand by that and I personally emailed you the book and also this paper as well. And so when Science Magazine interviewed me, I said I wasn't happy that they did that for the simple reason that had they actually got the copy of the 2000 11 edition, the very first edition, they would have known that I never stood by that evidence. And so I actually appreciated when Science Magazine interviewed me, they actually put it into the article that uh, I never stood by that evidence. And uh, that was many years ago. We've printed many, many books since then uh, in the second edition. And uh, that evidence hasn't uh, been in our books for a very, very long time. And uh, I was basically the first creationist to have gone back and said, no, this isn't correct. This isn't a pterosaur at all. It's five individual pictographs that have not, nothing to do with a unified object, a unified creature, let alone a pterosaur. And so it's actually the creationists that pointed this out long before the evolutionists. And uh, so it's not an embarrassment to the creationist community whatsoever. We were actually pointing this out years before this paper came out this year. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, 
you use that keyword integrity. I like that, and uh, I, I agree. It was it was very good of Science Magazine when they did that news report. Uh, they actually, I thought they did you justice. Uh, they they were they did, and I I actually left a message for the the lady that did the interview because it's a rarity mm -hmm. that that they they treat our interviews fairly, and I I basically told her thank you. I appreciated that. Yes, because uh, frankly, I think Kellick and uh, Kellick and uh, team, the authors of the uh, antiquity paper, I think they owe you an apology, frankly. But uh, well, you know, Marvin Rowe and his techniques, and and I told her this, and she never really mentioned this in the paper, but uh, Doctor Doctor Marvin Rowe and his techniques for authenticating, uh, and and the different research that they do with ancient artwork. Uh, I really believe he's a type of genius, mm -hmm. and and I, I can't give him uh, the credibility that he really really has and really needs in the archaeological community when it comes to rock art. Uh, there are a number of different techniques that he's developed mm -hmm. uh, over the years, and one of the techniques that's that's been developed and published in peer-reviewed journals is plasma oxidation, and uh, maybe we'll get to talk about this in a little bit. But Dr. Marvin Rowe, for nearly two decades now, has developed a technique known as plasma oxidation, which allows the dating of pigments that have been painted on rocks without the interference of, for example, calcium carbonate, if that happens to be the matrix upon which the pigments have been painted. Of course, calcium carbonate, uh, you can get a date on calcium carbonate. And you don't want to date the rocks or the matri matrix, you actually want to date the pigments. And so I really appreciate Dr. Marvin Rowe. I actually talked to him on the phone a number of years ago about the plasma oxidation technique uh, that he developed a number of years ago. And so I, I expressed, uh, and so I, I don't write them off, and I don't, you know, I don't really need an apology. I think that what was printed in Science Magazine brought things up to speed as far as the fact that, you know, I, I was there before uh, they published the papers. And uh, I came to this conclusion long before they published any of these papers about this. And so we came to our own conclusions that this was not a pterosaur. And of course, this, this brings up the million dollar question, okay, uh, which you alluded to. Okay, this pictograph is a mistake. We even acknowledge and agree with that. So what about all the other pictographs, carvings, cave art, etc., cetera, uh, by the, what, dozens or hundreds from around the world with which depict dinosaurs? Uh, I mean, you're, okay, your, di your Dire Dragons book alone, you documented how many new examples? Well, in the Dire Dragons book, uh, which was just sort of the tip of the iceberg, mm -hmm. Uh, there, there are 26 examples in Dire Dragons. And that was just one book. <laughs> That's just one book. Now, I, yeah. I love this. Uh, Live Science, of course, did an article on the Kellogg paper, and Benjamin Smith, a professor of world rock art, made an interesting and, frankly, anti-science comment. He said, Since Native American art is of spiritual significance and holds significant religious content, Images can also depict magical and mythical subject matter, said Smith. Uh, not all animals in Native American art, therefore, need to depict real-world creatures. Some will be supernatural, but none will be dinosaurs. Emphasis in the original article. Now, this is an, an interesting comment for several reasons. Most notably, uh, he has put forward his scientific conclusions before he even examined the evidence. That's anti-science. Now, when I sent you that quote, you immediately responded with a picture. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, of course, we remember the so-called refutation of the sauropod dinosaur at Kachina Bridge within Natural Bridges National Monument, to which I responded with my refutation of the refutation. <laughs> uh-huh. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the so-called original refutation uh, by the evolutionary community uh, was by two individuals who hadn't actually even been up on the ledge. And uh, I pointed out on my website, untoldsecretsofplanetearth.com, and the, my refutation of the refutation is still up there, that... Uh, 
<clears throat> the creationists had, had been up on the ledge many, many times before. And that requires getting a ladder down there. And so just to demonstrate that this, this isn't really difficult, I hauled the ladder down there myself. And uh, it took me less than 26 minutes uh, from the top to get the ladder down. And uh, I got up on the ledge and I examined the petroglyph from within inches away, which is really the only way to examine this thing. And demonstrated that the so-called scientific analysis that was done is just simply flat out wrong on a number of different points. And I went through all of the details of this and thoroughly refuted all of these things, talked about the different uh, techniques that, are, that were used by the ancient Native American Indians, etc., etc., etc. The fact of the matter is that this is still powerful, positive evidence that the Native American Indians, the Anasazi Indians, had to have seen these creatures. Are there, are there dinosaur bones there, Ian? Yes, there are bits and pieces of dinosaur bones. Mm -hmm. But, as you well know, those bones are firmly anchored in very solid rock. Uh, there's no doubt that the Native American Indians of that region saw bits and pieces of bones, maybe picked them up, but to excavate an entire sauropod, as I, as I explain in my book, Untold Secrets of Planet Earth, Dire Dragons, we're talking about uh, a problem that nobody has been able to explain. It's taken 200 years to develop the techniques, to develop the tools, to develop the glues. And even if you get all the bones, now we, we're talking about anatomy and physiology knowledge in order to put those bones together correctly. We're talking about now soft tissues. And the interesting thing is if people all over the world were digging up the bones, why do they uh, almost never depict the bones? They depict these creatures in uh, with with the flesh on in living positions interacting with people and that's exactly what you see at Kachina Bridge is a creature that is in a living pose with the flesh on and so all over the world we see this not just the Kachina Bridge but the creature at Kachina Bridge without any question beyond a reasonable doubt is a sauropod dinosaur now I've had people say oh but his neck is up in the air and we know from our reconstructions of the fossils that sauropods held their necks out almost straight and so when we have a posture like this almost straight up it's incorrect they couldn't have possibly seen a dinosaur like that because it's completely incorrect well here's what's interesting in 2009 a gentleman by the name of Darren Nash challenged the secular paleontological community based on those reconstructions and he said you know what you guys are wrong based on everything that we see living today you guys are dealing with dead dry bones and if you take a look at the paper that Darren Nash wrote he said there ha there has to be a lot more flexibility than what you guys are talking about and so he was looking at the tails he was looking at the necks of creatures such as sauropods and he is suggesting that there was a lot more flexibility than what they uh, previously allowed. I believe it's 2009. Uh, Darren Nash is the name of the gentleman that did the paper. And he's done a lot of papers dealing with fossils. And he's basically saying, you paleontologists don't do a really good job when you're trying to deal with dead, dry bones. And uh, so he also uh, did some other work dealing with fossils as well, such as the giant rabbit and uh, they, they reconstructed the rabbit with the neck basically straight out and he said why in the world would you think the neck would be straight out when living rabbits have their necks up like this and so very interesting papers this guy's writing secular guy secular uh, uh, communities science guy and uh, so you know when we see artwork with the necks up why do we have a problem with that right right and so anyway that's just one example and of course there's examples all over the world we can go into the Amazon rainforest mm -hmm. again we see another sauropod yep. surrounded by nine hunters and uh, this was the show we did actually I think we did two shows on this Ian yep. and of course at the time I'm not sure if we had finished the scientific analysis or not do you recall? No, uh, we, you had just finished the scientific analysis but you had not yet published uh, your latest book which I okay. still didn't get a copy okay <laughs> Amazon expedition <laughs> 
<laughs> Amazon uh, Expedition. And, and so I was uh, mentioning Dr. Marvin Rowe and his technique called plasma oxidation, published in the scientific literature now for 20 years. And uh, plasma oxidation was actually, because the skeptics raged, the pigments were too bright. At the end of the day, um, those pigments were tested with plasma oxidation. Mm -hmm. Demonstrated to be authentic, another sauropod uh, with his neck fairly high up in the air, and here we we have it again: sauropod surrounded by nine hunters in the Amazon rainforest. And based on the testing of those pigments, we're talking about three, give or take, three thousand years ago. Right. So I mean, how many pieces of artwork that have been proven to be authentic? Uh, you know, we're talking about petroglyphs and pictographs only right now because of the Black Dragon Canyon uh, that turned out not to be a pterosaur. But it's not like it is the only uh, petroglyph, pictograph, etc. that has been found. Now, there are many other pieces of artwork around the world that are carvings, that are tapestries, that are three-dimensional, that are much, much more impressive than mere petroglyphs and pictographs and some of those are in my book and we're working on a third edition and uh, it's exciting stuff Ian. It's exciting for Bible believing Christians and I can just see about 500 thumbs down gonna be on this video now because I said that you know and the atheists are gonna get all worked up and how can you possibly believe in in the Bible and dinosaurs and people that's ridiculous well, there's so much more evidence that uh, we're getting ready to publish, so much more stuff, and uh, it really seems incredible. It seems incredible because I was raised outside the church. I was raised uh, to believe in anything but the Bible, but the more and more we get out there and the more and more real science that we do and the more and more we investigate this world, the more and more it actually blows my mind that uh, I spent uh, 19 years outside of the church mocking the Christians for having to go to the church and read and study that what I thought was a ridiculous book, a ridiculous religion, Christianity. How foolish can people really be? That's how I thought. You know, as I drove by uh, in my friend's Pontiac Firebird playing ACDC Hell's Bells, yes, that's what I did. And now I look back and I say, wow, was I ever missing out? The Bible is actually true. Wow. I was on the other side of the fence, Ian. Mm -hmm. And now the atheists are probably looking at me saying, man, look at that kook. <laughs> That's okay. I don't mind. Because I was a guy on the other side of the fence looking at the Christians saying, man, those guys are kooks. <laughs> it's okay. I don't mind. I'll make whatever you want. makes no difference to me. And, Excellent. Well, thanks so much for sharing, and thanks so much for being on the season premiere of the show. Uh, I know the viewers. No uh, I know the viewers really look forward to this. I had a lot of comments uh, the last two times you were on the show, so it's always good to have you on. Good to be on, Ian. You can get copies of the latest editions of the Untold Secrets of Planet Earth books from UntoldSecretsOfPlanetEarth.com, all one word. And while I haven't had the privilege of seeing the final Amazon Expedition book, I did have the privilege of seeing the final digital copies of the pages before it was sent to printing. Uh, all of them are typical, gorgeous books. Uh, great coffee table readers and just a fun read, which will, will definitely provoke discussion about creation and evolution and the evidence for creation. This interview was edited for television, but you can catch the entire interview on our website, genesisweek.com. Stick around, we'll be back in one minute. Complete Creation video series is just that, an exhaustive look at the science, philosophy, and theology behind the creation-evolution debate. In this 12-DVD series, Ian Juby starts off with a one-hour presentation for the children in God's Little Creation. He then follows up with almost 11 hours of lecturing for the adults as he walks you through the debate starting at its surprising history. 
and examining the evidence from biology, geology, physics, paleontology, and archaeology. Chances are, any question you have about the creation-evolution debate is answered in this video series. With open captions for the hearing impaired, the series is both entertaining and educational. There are also free resources such as question and answer and proctor sheets for homeschoolers. You can now get the entire set as an instant digital download or on DVD. Visit Ian's Bookstore today. Woohoo! Mail for me! After a long and desperately needed summer off, we still got flooded with both love and hate mail. Thanks to all who wrote in, alas, we had major problems with the Genesis Week website over the summer, and I wasn't able to deal with it. Scott emailed us. Ian and team, tremendous show. I have been a growing apologist for a few years now, but I have become a complete addict of Genesis Week and leaning hard towards its subset, Young Earth Creation. I know you are working hard to maintain the show, your career, your hobbies, and your life, but I want to encourage you. The information you are giving on this wonderful show is simply not as readily available anywhere else, and it is ID gold. Thank you so much for everything you and the ID community are doing at the expense of your savings and your sanity. <laughs> You're an incredible boon to those of us on the front lines, and I cannot adequately convey my thanks enough. Keep it up, and we'll support you with a consistent prayer and funds as best we can. In Christ, Scott. P.S. I have passed the addiction off to my son recently, and will get my apologetics class hooked as well. <laughs> well, thanks for the kind words, Scott. You don't know what that means to me. All right, got to call this a wrap. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Thank you for joining me, and I hope you'll join me again next Genesis Week. Remember, you can send in your comments, questions, and letter bombs to us in a number of ways. You can email us at comments at genesisweek.com, or you can send us a tweet at genesisweek, or you can go to our website, genesisweek.com, find the most recent show, and comment there. Or you can visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash genesisweektv. Remember those words of our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you on the flip side. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjuby.org donations, and thank you for your support. Thank you.